I'm Martha Rarity. I'm the Executive Director of Nashwood, which is the association that represents state aging and disability agencies throughout the United States. Our partners um, at Mercer and I, or in, and Nashwood, have been working on the um, long-term care redesign project for the state of Nebraska, and we're really excited to have this opportunity to share with you um, what our, some of the draft findings of the um, redesign plan look like. So with that, I'm going to open it up and show you that um, this is the timeline of the project. Um, in January of last year, um, many of you know that the Department of Health and Human Services released the concept paper. The concept paper um, had outlined many facets of um, the current Medicaid long-term care program for the state of Nebraska. They highlighted areas where they thought they needed to um, consider some reform. And then they also highlighted areas where they hoped that um, consumers and stakeholders would weigh in um, with their ideas for um, improving, improving the um, system. The state contracted with Mercer and then Mercer subcontracted with Nashua to help to do um, stakeholder engagement throughout um, the, the state and throughout this process. Our first step was in June of last year we um, um, were, uh, we traveled out to the state and we met with um, some key informants and discussed issues um, that were important to them. We asked for them to help us in disseminating all of the material to their um, key um, groups. Many of them um, were individuals that had um, large mailing lists and had groups of colleagues that they could share information with. So it was, a, it was key to our dissemination strategy. Then in September, um, we took two weeks and we toured the state, um, had a beautiful tour um, in um, the first two weeks of September, I guess the second and third week of September, I'm sorry, um, and had the opportunity during the day, we went and visited sites where consumers were being served, so that was um, assisted living, some nursing facilities, um, adult day, um, senior centers, um, <clears throat> excuse me, some shelter workshops and some just regular employment um, programs that the state was operating. And it was a really, really rich um, opportunity for us to see the value that the um, state Medicaid program was providing to the consumers during the day. It also afforded us um, the opportunity to hear from a wider array <clears throat> of consumers. When we, and then in the evening, each of the cities that we toured across the state, we hosted um, stakeholder listening sessions where we asked for their reaction and responses to the um, um, concept paper and asked for um, ways that they thought that the state could improve the long-term care plan. We came back with the um, findings from the stakeholder sessions and really came up with a preliminary list of about 25 recommendations that the stakeholders had um, developed for us. <clears throat> at the same time that we were doing that, our partners at Mercer were investigating what was happening at the state. They were comparing the state to and their programs and plans with other states. Um, looking into what are some of the promising practices that are occurring in other states um, and things that they could copy, um, kind of copy and paste from other states. So together we put forward um, this draft of the redesign plan. And one of the things that I'm very excited about was from the very beginning, the state really made an effort to make sure and to ensure, not only make sure, but to ensure that the state um, did hear from this wide array of stakeholders. Um, as I said, again, we're traveling the state. Lowell and I were um, last week in Omaha, Fremont, um, Norfolk, and Miss Lincoln. <laughs> okay, forget Lincoln. Um, and this week, my colleague is um, actually at the same hour. Um, she is up doing the um, western part of the state. Um, we had so many comments coming in that originally the comments were, um, we wanted comments to come in by April 14th, 
We've extended it by a couple of weeks so that additional people will be able to comment on the redesign and really be able to, to digest all of the reforms and um, suggestions that we've included in there. So tentatively, the deadline now for when we're going to um, have the final long-term care redesign back to the state is sometime in June or July. Um, and we'll be working as soon as possible to get that um, all finished for you. So I think these are the guiding principles that are on your screen. I think they're really key and critical to um, the whole foundation of what the state um, was um, proposing when they began their concept paper. And I think I'd like to really highlight them when we're doing these open discussions because um, of the way in which they were worded, the order in which they were put, I think is really critical. So the first is that they want to improve the quality of services and the health outcomes of recipients. Um, the second is to promote independent living in the least restrictive setting through the use of consumer focused and individualized services and living options. I think I'm, the next one is that they wanted to strengthen the access, coordination, and integration of care through streamlined um, eligibility processes and um, care management models. They also wanted to improve the capacity to match available resources with individual needs through different benefits and innovative benefit structures, and then streamline and better align um, the administrative framework that the department has so that it's easier for clients and providers to have a, a much more streamlined um, process um, at the agency. And then finally, to um, balance the system and refocus it so that it matches the demand for services um, in a way that is sustainable for the state. So one of the ways that we um, talked about this that um, became a, um, an easier to understand because um, being from D.C. and Lowell's just cracking up because I changed the pictures a little bit from yesterday. Um, I invented all these um, individuals. We could come in and talk about um, the various um, reform um, proposals that we put in in a very clinical, um, D.C.-like kind of um, way. But instead, what we've done is try to address them in a way that um, will explain it in a way that it will make sense to consumers. So what we said here is that this is Arvin, um, and he's a 90-year-old with significant um, macular degeneration. He's recovering from a recent six-month stay in a rehab um, following a significant head injury. He's being um, cared for currently in the home by his wife, and clearly his cat um, is also assisting him. Um, Arvin needs to be turned three times a night, prompted to eat. He's on bed centers, he's incontinent, and um, he gets combative when he's confused. He currently receives no assistance. His wife, who's his primary caregiver, um, also has significant health issues. And so one of the questions that we were, ask, were asking is, um, how is the long-term care system working with the hospital discharge planners and with the nursing home? And we have facilities to ensure that both um, and his wife um, can remain in, at home and in their communities for longer. And then who would she call? Who would his wife call it for assistance um, if she needed it? And then how would the state reach out to help her to do that? So in all likelihood, and the, the um, position point here is that Arvin is not yet um, a Medicaid client. Um, but it, in building a program that supports both Medicaid and um, the pre-Medicaid almost clients, we wanted to make sure that we could ensure help, and we heard that loud and clear throughout the state um, when we were traveling. So we said that we would provide help for Arvin and Judy through the development of a no wrong door. Um, and what we said was that um, access to the no wrong door would be able to be found by the um, Judy's visits to the doctor, the library, the grocery store, um, church, or any of a wide variety of sources, and not the typical health and human services um, bureaucratic kind of um, sources of, of how you find out about information, because our 
information has shown us that a lot of people don't know where to go or call, and we certainly found that when we were there last September. Um, the No Wrong Door um, that we are proposing would be um, built by a num with a number of partners, including the League of Human Dignity, the Area Agencies on Aging. We understand that there's a current pilot for aging and disability resource centers in um, the state, and we think that this is um, this is something that you would build upon. Um, you wouldn't. It, it's more supplemental to what they've started there with the um, pilot project, and then of course the Medicaid agency. The No Wrong Door would be able to provide public outreach um, and coordination to key referral sources, again for Medicaid and non-Medicaid. Um, Person-centered counseling so that you could really have an interview process with each of the consumers that's calling and ask for um, what they need and what services they're looking for. It could potentially do some assessments of the consumer's needs. Um, it could potentially, again, do streamlined function and eligibility. And then, um, very importantly, as I shared earlier, I think, um, the No Wrong Door um, that we're proposing would have access to both publicly funded programs, but also um, provide consumers with options that are private pay. Um, again, what we wanted to share with this in the No Wrong Door is a lot of the consumers that are aging in the state of Nebraska um, may have adult children, such as myself, living in Virginia that want to help care for my aunt or uncle that are living um, in a state far away. And so this would be one seamless approach to helping um, them. I could be um, paying um, and providing assistance financially um, to my aunt and uncle if I knew um, how to do that and what options were available. Um, we're very fortunate that there are um, 47 other states that have um, very active, I guess 48 now, 40, um, active and robust aging and disability resource centers, and we have more than 20, I think, states that have active and robust no wrong door systems. Those systems um, that we're talking about building for the state of Nebraska, um, that the state can learn um, from other states' experiences and you know, do a lot of sharing um, so that they won't have to create everything from scratch. The next consumer that we have, again, um, this is my friend Bob. I feel like I actually didn't just create him, that I actually know him. Um, he's a 29-year-old, but he's been in a wheelchair since he had a sledding accident in his teen years. He needs personal attendance services to help with some areas of um, his day-to-day -day life. Um, he wants to be in charge of his life, and, there, and, and that includes he wants to be in charge of hiring and firing staff um, that could provide assistance to him. But he would like some support in doing it. Um, he also would like to get a job. You can see he's got his laptop there. He's ready. He's willing and able to get a job, but he's very fearful that if he gets a job, um, he would lose his Medicaid. And therefore, even though he's got a good smile, <laughs> um, he's remained largely isolated in his, in his apartment. Um, so he also needs support to get in and out of the bed in the morning, and he worries about what would happen if his attendant did not show up. So under our redesign proposal, what we said was that there's many, many things that would help somebody like Bob. The first is that we would, or we're proposing to amend the aging and disability waiver um, so that it does include a consumer direction um, option for the consumers that do want to have more um, structure and be able to hire and fire and manage the budget um, that is set aside for the, to meet their needs. Um, we understand, however, that's really challenging for the best of us. I mean, paying taxes for people that you hire can be really challenging. So in order to ensure that Bob wouldn't have to worry about things like paying taxes or worrying about overtime, or learning how to budget for the support that he needs. Um, we're encouraging the state to hire a fiscal um, management services agency, and that agency can be of support to Bob, because Bob is still gonna be ultimately the one that hires and fires, but the fiscal management services agency would assist him in doing that. 
Um, additionally, we encourage the state to consider hiring a broker um, that would help um, have all of the workers that are available, the personal attendant workers, um, they would be in a system with their resumes and references from where they've worked before. Um, some kind of, some states have done sort of things like Yelp reviews, um, and it can work like a match.com where you put in kind of the preferences and what times of day you want somebody and what things that they, that you want them to do how you like them to do it, whether you like to be called Martha or Miss or Ma'am, all of those things can be included in the um, individual um, broker um, system. We did not recommend, however, which system or the, that the state should purchase, nor did we recommend for the Fiscal Management Services Agency a specific system. We just indicated that we thought that the state should consider doing that. And then finally, um, we also said that Bob would have the assurance that his workers would show up um, uh, or a backup would be sent um, because we did recommend that the state put in place a new electronic visit verification. So this electronic visit verification is a system that um, would allow for some remote monitoring. Um, it can help ensure that the person that's supposed to be showing up does show up and that the services that they're requesting um, are actually delivered, and then how long it took somebody to deliver those services. Um, we heard from our time last week in the state that people are a little bit concerned about um, doing some things like using an iPhone, or, for example, to do the electronic visit verification because um, we understand the rest is quite rural. Um, we had our own trouble sometimes in some pockets getting our bars. Um, but there are other ways that the, the electronic visit verification can work, and, and that can be as simple as using a landline and punching in numbers um, to indicate what services you're delivering at that point. Um, and then one last thing that we wanted to ensure was that Bob would also be able to learn about the Medicaid buy-in program um, and that would allow him to potentially work without losing his Medicaid benefits. He could learn about that through the, um, and the state does have that program right now, but it's not a, a very widely utilized program. There are other programs too that the um, state can share with individuals that do wanna work. It's just because they're underutilized, there needs to be a little bit more training and education about the programs that, and the options that are out there. Potentially, we also heard last week that there might need to be some tweaking of some of the um, buy-in programs to make it a little bit more um, flexible so that people that really truly like Bob want to work can work. Um, the next is um, Maria, and Maria is the woman that I selected to be my personal care attendant worker for this slide presentation. And what we said for Maria um, in terms of the redesign is that currently she's finding it really difficult to find and maintain um, employment. She gets really frustrated with, with the multiple ways that she has to provide all the documentation of her work um, for the different programs. And she's also frustrated because even though she loves her work, and you can see from this great big smile on her face that she loves working in the field, um, she's barely able to um, keep doing it because of the difficulty she's finding staying in it. So what we said for Maria under this um, program is that she could have more clients than ever because of the expansion of the aging and disability waiver and the ability for the consumers to self-direct their care. So. Um, that would allow for a lot of consumers that haven't had the opportunity in the past to hire and fire um, people like Maria on their own. She also wouldn't have to worry, however, about not being paid on time or having her taxes withheld because, as we shared before, the Fiscal Management Services Agency would ensure the payment um, uh, for Maria. She'd also have confidence in the system because um, she would be using the new system, as we just talked about, the electronic visit verification system, and that system would, is designed to really help both Maria and um, Bob ensure that the services are being delivered in a timely fashion and that um, she's also getting 
compensated fairly for what she's doing and how long it took her to do them. Um, she could also have her resume now and um, her name and background and all of the recommendations that she wants to included in the support broker that we recommend at the state um, put in place um, so that she can highlight her skills and services. I'm going to take a quick break here and ask um, Lowell, if he wants to add anything, and at the same time, I'll ask Allie if anybody has entered any questions into the chat box at this point, um, and then we can go and continue on with the, the conversation. So the only thing that I would add uh, with regards to all of this is um, with regards to the support brokerage, as Martha was saying, there's an ability for uh, the provider to actually have not just their name and resume, but, but recommendations, further credentials that they might have um, that someone might want to look at, um, and, and basically how she works with individuals with disabilities and seniors so that she's able to be able to, so that the individuals will know basically what exactly she, how she serves them and, and how she works with individuals. Um, I think you covered everything else, though. Thanks, Bo. Um, yeah, I detected you one of the attendee questions. Okay, I will look in my text. Um, so what are the names of the companies that were used to help with the concept paper? Can you talk about both companies' qualifications a bit? You bet. So um, as I shared with you in the beginning, and Clearly not enough. Um, the, there was an RFP a request for proposal. Um, and see, when I was there last week, if I said an acronym, I had to throw candy at you. I can't throw candy at you, but I'm thinking it. Um, I'm trying to break all of those habits. Anyway, there was a request for proposal that the state um, put out um, last year after the concept paper was released, and the um, the bid that was selected was um, the, the bid that Mercer um, put out. Mercer is a consulting company that works in, I think, virtually all of the states and some international, and they're very, they have a lot of experts in Medicaid, they have a lot of experts in long-term care, um, and in redesign um, overall. Um, they also, on their team, have um, uh, parents with children with disabilities, um, um, parent, um, individuals that are caring for older um, parents that need caregiving as well. They asked um, Nashua to um, be the sub on this project. Nashua is, um, as I shared earlier, it's the national association that represents all state um, agencies on aging and disability services. We've done um, this type of work with redesign and stakeholder work um, in uh, almost all of the states of, at some point. Um, our organization is 53 years old. This year we were founded um, on the, uh, um, the states founded us when they wanted to start the Older Americans Act. Um, so it actually started the year before the Older Americans Act was um, um, decided. Then in 2010, um, the members saw that they're delivering services to individuals with disabilities in the states and their state agencies. And because we mirror what the state agencies are doing, um, we added the disability portfolio into our um, portfolio. And at the, um, a little bit later, um, the membership also amended and added the long-term care Medicaid um, um, program also formally into our association. So the long-term care Medicaid um, directors in each of the states are members, um, and we are governed by a board of directors that is made up of state directors of these programs. So we have two kind of main focuses that we do. One is the state-to-state -state exchange of information so that we do know about some promising practices and what states have learned from things that have gone wrong and things that have gone well. Um, and we share them so that you don't have to um, duplicate or replicate things um, and spend additional resources. And then our other job is to really help the states 
um, by advocating and educating them on what's happening at the federal level. That leads us actually into a really kind of um, next point that we want to share with you that we shared when we were there um, in um, Nebraska last week, and that was that um, a lot of this was written, or all of this was written as the, everything is shifting and the administrations were changing. To the best of our ability, we're trying to keep our um, eye on the ball of what's happening in D.C. Um, um, but as you know, a lot of the reform um, will, will come into play um, if there is reform. When I was there last week, um, I don't have, I don't wear one of those um, crystal ball hats, um, and I don't, but I did say that I didn't think there'd be block grants, and then I think within three hours or something, they changed and said there'd be block grants for some populations for not, not for others. Again, we're going to do our best to keep our eye on the ball and um, make sure <clears throat> that um, everybody is, um, everything is reviewed. Um, I have another question. Um, no, we have a couple. Um, wow, we've got a lot. This is great. <laughs> sorry that I'm, I'm sorry that I'm doing it this way. This is the easiest way for Allie to send them to me. Um, another attendee is asking that, and she's saying that she has a brother in an individual group home and he's not able to deal with finances. The way we handle his care through a provider wouldn't change, would it? Um, no, no. So um, let me let me reassure you that um, consumer directed. Um, care is, it's an option. So it's only an option, I mean, it's, it's an option for those individuals that choose to take it. And as I shared last week, um, my sister has a son with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities and lives in a different state. But when she was presented with the choice to manage her son's care and have a physical intermediary, she said, why would I want that? Um, so some people don't want to do that because it's just a lot of work. So I think you don't have to do that at all. It's just an option. Um, the next question was, um, I'm curious what will happen, and Lowell, you can chime in at any point too. I'm curious what will happen with existing providers of services that are not, necessary, ne not necessarily medical providers. This appears to be a great design for independent providers. I've been um, a contracted DD provider for 20 years, and it does feel as though there's underlying plan to reduce specialized providers and promote independent providers in the DD community. Can you provide insight to that? And Lowell, do you want to take that on, or I, I'm happy sure, to? I'd, I'd be happy to. Go for so it. as Martha explained, um, self-directed services it really started um, from from the civil rights of um, movement in the disability community for individuals with primarily physical disabilities. Uh, certainly there are some folks in um, within the developmental disabilities community that want to and want to look into um, receiving their services by self-direction or the, or the families as well. But primarily what this has been doing, what, what, where we're going is that, that people have, will have the option both to provide provider-based services or self-directed services. This is certainly not a recommendation to move forward with and to allow people to, um, you know, for provider-based services not to go forward. And just so that you know, um, my background, I spent 14 years running a provider association for individual for providers serving people with developmental disabilities. Um, I also worked in the state of New Jersey as uh, Deputy Commissioner for Human Services. So, so I've been through some of these changes and um, can speak to them specifically. I think even more speaking to them specifically, Lowell, you're an ardent supporter of the provider network for the DD community. <laughs> and, yeah. and believe me, there's nobody that um, would have, I mean, he's so supportive but also um, are, um, would have not allowed for a change to go forward that was anti-provider um, in any sense of the word. We believe very firmly that there's got to be, uh, that we need to nurture and support the providers that are in the entire system in the state of Nebraska. So I hope that that message is resonating um, with the 
the people that are participating in that call, um, because that was certainly our intent. Um, I have one more question, and then we're going to move on for a little bit. But these, thank you so much for all the great questions. I just want to make sure that we can get through the whole presentation. Um, so this is a really good one because both Lowell and I are really passionate supporters of the Medicaid buy-in. I don't know what the recommend. I don't know what the rest of the question. I just know it's about the Medicaid buy-in, <laughs> but I'm excited that it is. <laughs> so it says they're glad to hear about the Medicaid buy-in recommendation. Education and awareness is great and desperately needed, both by individuals with disabilities and the Medicaid division staff. However, there's, there are some structural problems with the design of the program. And we heard that last week. I'm going to finish reading, but we did hear that last week. Um, and it says, perhaps strengthening the recommendations with language like work with individuals with disabilities and advocacy organizations to design adjustments to the Medicaid buy-in so that more people can use the program. Excellent suggestion. I, I love that. And um, I think that that's an excellent suggestion. Um, based and, on what and, we heard last week. And, and there are some best practices in many different states uh, that, that can be moved forward on this so uh, to, to assist Nebraska in doing, in, in enhancing their Medicaid buy-in program. Right, so just so that we can get through the slide deck, um, I want you to meet Jeffrey. Um, and for those of you that saw the slide deck last week, um, this is different Jeffrey. Um, Jeffrey last week was my nephew, but this is a different Jeffrey. I just made this up. Um, but he's 19-year-old, nonverbal um, uh, non male with intellectual and developmental disabilities. He needs assistance with walking and stairs, can't feed himself or dress himself, likely a suitable candidate for a day program, but doesn't know where to find one, um, currently being cared for by his parents. Um, needs an assessment to determine if he's qualified for a group home. Um, because he's nonverbal, um, his parents um, and he really get agitated um, during the assessment process. Um, and so that's a very stressful thing. And then finally, we said that he needed assistance to find out what services he would receive after he graduates from high school. Um, Again, moving on to additional recommendations. Helps to somebody like Jeffrey underneath the um, program. What we said was that Jeffrey's mom and dad would um, know that Jeffrey's long-term care needs could be better met because we're going to put in place a standardized assessment um, tool. Um, that would be not just for the intellectual and developmental um, disabilities, um, clients, but all of the clients for aging and disabilities, um, anybody that needs long-term services and support would, would receive the same assessment. The assessment would have, um, in addition to the hub, questions that are similar for everybody, then it has folks and different um, questions that would be more specifically designed for somebody, for example, with a brain injury or somebody that needs um, attention because of intellectual and developmental disabilities or somebody that's a senior, um, potentially with dementia. There's, there's a whole bunch of different questions. We didn't recommend a specific assessment tool, but we did recommend finding one that's evidence-based, that's been um, proven to have reliability and validity so that if I do the assessment, I'm trained and do the assessment, and Lowell's trained and does the assessment that we get the same score for the same individual. Um, unfortunately, um, in many states, in Nebraska, it's not different. Um, a lot of the assessment tools are kind of homegrown or have been changed around um, so that some, uh, some um, of the assessments are, are deemed not to be fair. Um, and some of the consumers were saying that they knew that their child had the same level basically as somebody else, and they didn't feel like they were getting the same level of services. That fairness um, would be, um, is, is really important in ensuring an overall healthy um, program. And so we, we really wanted to make sure that the assessment process was put in place. Um, <clears throat> additionally, um, we said that um, the Department of Health and Human Services would work with Jeffrey's family and Jeffrey, um, as well as the Department of Education to help to make the 
transition that he's going to be facing of, of moving from school into the community as easy as possible. And potentially, um, many states are working with the no wrong door system um, as one additional option of helping to assist um, families as they're moving um, into a community setting from um, the current setting that they're in with the educational system. That full transition um, from the educational system for the parents with children with developmental disabilities is a very challenging one because you've been so supported for all of the K-12 and many times pre-K-12. Um, um, and so <clears throat> it's a really um, fragile time and we just want to make sure that it's smoothed out. We are very pleased that the state has made efforts already to help to smooth that out. We're just, we just put it in as a recommendation that they need to keep their eye on that and um, to continue to listen to the stakeholders um, for their advice and counsel as to what are some additional things that would help to make it even smoother. Um, so moving forward. Sure, so the next one is, um, I see that I got some questions, but I'm gonna go to the next slide first and then we'll go through. Um, the first one is um, meet the long-term care providers. Um, some are sharing that they are having to provide care care management for the families that they serve. Um, Lola and I faced, or heard that when we were out in September. Um, they are having to stay informed of multiple state systems and programs. Um, and each of the programs had different terms and terminologies. They all had different rules um, and they seem to be changing all of the time. Um, they also expressed concern both in September and then last week again about Medicaid payments, not keeping up with the cost of running a business. <clears throat> so under the, <clears throat> excuse me, under the redesign um, project, one thing that we um, put in is that we're hope, hoping that the state would consider consolidating the functions of the Department of Health and Human Services. And that and the reason that we want to do that is for a bunch of reasons. One is to ensure consistency in how you would enroll in a program. Um, we heard a lot of loud frustration with the notion that you'd have to go this way and this way and that way um, for the different programs as you were enrolling into them um, under the Medicaid program, even though it's the same program because the different waivers. Um, we also think that if you consolidated the agency functions, you'd have uh, smoother operations. Um, and then hopefully it would improve the overall experience um, because the department would be um, interacting um, with the, the providers um, less frequently and um, with much more ease. Um, we heard loudly in September, but um, we hope that it's smoothing out, um, that the um, there were some issues around the provider enrollment. Um, we understand that that is moving out, um, but we want to make sure, again, just like we did with the uh, transition, that the state keeps its eye on the um, prize, which is to make sure that it's easy to enroll and encourages participation so that the providers stay in the program. And then also we um, included that we wanted to have in there a process that the state would rebase home and community-based services rates more frequently. Um, Lowell, did you want to add anything while I look at the questions? Sure. <clears throat> one, I know that this was one of the questions actually, how will um, extended family home um, be, be impacted? And one of our recommendations specifically is to, um, it wouldn't change the way in which the individuals are served, but it would, we recommend that the department um, require by regulation that all extended family homes receive a regular on-site licensure review. And that if, um, if because of staffing and budget issues that this doesn't, um, this isn't something that the department can move forward on um, specifically that, um, that really that it, they would revise and they'd require all provider agencies to perform the regular audits um, annually for the extended family homes to determine compliance with requirements. And these, so it doesn't impact the individuals being served, it just provides additional assurances for, uh, for the uh, 
the individual's loved ones that they are actually getting cared for in the appropriate manner uh, necessary and what's required by the state. So it looks like, Lil, you answered the last question, but there were a couple questions in between as well. So I'm going to say that the question on extended family homes was addressed. Um, it, there's a question here that says, um, how will it, this affect folks with developmental disability services and how will service coordination be affected? Do you want to take that one, Lowell? Certainly. So yeah, um, let me just let me just start by saying too that um, we have separate webinars coming up in the next. I think I'm always going to tell me for sure, but I think it's April 10th for the services coordinators, um, so that we can go through all of their questions. But just so everybody else knows what's happening with the services coordinators, why don't you go through and talk about that? Certainly. So, um, so um, we are going to the next uh, batch of um, slides. We'll talk a little bit about this, but we are recommending the move to manage long-term care um, beginning in uh, January of 2019 for individual seniors and individuals with physical disabilities, and then uh, for individuals with developmental disabilities, we're recommending that that go into effect in July of 2019. Um, what this would mean is that the individuals, um, that, that the managed care organizations would actually provide and coordinate services both for their individual physical health, behavioral health, pharmacy, and also their long-term service needs. Service coordinators will be utilized, will be needed throughout for a variety of things for what they currently do. Um, some of them will be employed and will be hired by the managed care organizations to provide those kinds of coordinated services. Um, and there will be, and there's every state that has gone through this has, has gone through and, 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 and created transition plans for it. In addition, the service coordinators also will be um, working towards and will be working with the state on the realignment issues and they will be also at the front lines of coordinating and um, and overseeing the the managed care organizations and the, to ensure that that the plans of care is care for the individuals are being utilized and um, and and the like. So that is um, much of what what's going to happen. That will happen over over that two year period. And as I said, states which have, who have gone through this already, and there are 22 states currently who are in managed long term services and sports, and then additional five states who are moving towards it uh, fairly quickly um, will um, have set up transition periods. For, for the service coordinators to work with with uh, with both the individuals and the managed care organizations. Right. Um, I want to keep going so that we can get through those slides. Um, and we jumped around a little bit because we answered about managed care and we haven't even <laughs> opened it yet. But the biggest um, important thing in most of the questions that are um, included is um, around making sure that there's some type of continuity of care for the consumers and actually quite frankly for some of the providers too as we move from one system to the other. And as Lowell shared, um, that's one of the really important facets of any, any change that we're making is to make sure that it's as seamless as possible. So let's just introduce this a little bit and then um, I can go back and answer additional questions that people are concerned about. The first is that um, we heard last week that people were confused about what Heritage Health was. Um, they're skeptical um, about what managed care is. They've heard some reports from neighboring states. Um, they're confused about how the managed care organizations are paid and will be paid. Um, they want to understand why the state moves, it may move in this direction. They're worried about the quality of the services provided. Um, Consumers with disabilities are really concerned that, as we're seeing in some of the questions that I'm getting, um, that they will lose services or be forced um, to return to institutional settings. Um, and then finally, um, we heard some concerns from services coordinators and other providers that they would lose their jobs um, if we move to um, managed care. So the basic thing is to think about this in terms of 
um, managed care. So my colleague uh, Camille had a good analogy probably for um, uh, football fans out there, and that is that the Heritage Health is like the Big Ten, and then there's three plans that are underneath it. So it's the managing entity is the Big Ten, but then Nebraska Total Care is one plan, well care is another of the managed care plans, and then United Healthcare is the third um, health plan. And they've been in operation just a short while since um, January of 2017. Um, and they're under contract to provide physical, behavioral, and pharmacy needs at this point. That's it. Um, and I'm going to um, change it to the next slide, but first I want to say the, the way that they're reimbursed is based on um, amount of money per person and per month um, for the plan. And those members that are, um, that, whose needs are higher, <laughs> oh, there goes my dog, <laughs> um, will have to pay, um, or they will receive higher um, reimbursements for those needs. So what's covered right now are things like the doctor's visits, um, prescriptions, hospitals, skilled nursing, um, um, birthing center, mental health, vision, um, family planning, et cetera. But you'll see on there, there are no um, services currently that are um, long-term services and support that are being covered under the managed care. That is, right now, we're only doing the physical health, the behavioral health, and the pharmaceutical. Um, the plan, however, does propose that, as Lowell um, indicated, that in January of 2019, we would roll um, the um, aging and physically disabled into the long-term services and support entity, um, and that could include the list of services that we outlined um, here on this slide. This is completely um, for illustration purposes only. This is a list that actually I pulled from the state of New Jersey um, in, in honor of Lowell. This is what is included in his long-term services and support plan um, when he was there in New Jersey for the managed long-term services and support. So it could include at that point the respite, the care management, home delivered meals, adult day, supported employment, um, all of the other things that are not um, that are non-medical but that make living in the community um, so, and um, in supporting individuals with disabilities and seniors much, much easier. Um, Lowell, um, I'm yes. going to pitch it to you, and then you can maybe read off why the state is going in this direction. I'll look at the questions and see if I can sure. answer some of them. Sure. So, so, so the, um, really what is um, managed long-term services allows the consumers to be served in their own unique way um, and, and with plans of care that are very person-centered. Um, managed care organizations have flexibility um, that the state doesn't always have um, um, that will allow them to serve individuals and provide different services, um, getting everybody from what we used to call in New Jersey Bob the Builder to help with home modification and uh, do uh, vehicle modification as well as a variety of other things. In addition, it also allows individuals, it allows as I said earlier, an integration of the services, not just for physical and behavioral and pharmacy care, but also for their long-term services so that they can see those individuals. Um, in addition, um, consumers like Bob that we showed would be able to stay in the community and receive services. What we found in New Jersey was um, prior to the move to manage long-term services and supports, uh, there had been a law enacted saying that the state should move to and keep people uh, in the community. However, we are only moving people about, we are only changing um, the percentage by about 1% a year. So only 1% per 
per year were going into home community-based services instead of instead of into nursing homes. So when we started managed long-term services, uh, right before we started, there was only 27.9% of individuals were receiving managed long-term services or receiving home and community-based services. In the two and a half years, so that was in July of 2014, by December of 2016, we ended up having 43.2% of individuals receiving services in home and community-based services. Other states such as Tennessee, Arizona, Texas, and the like saw also very significant changes in the way in how many individuals receive home and community-based services instead of uh, institutional services. This doesn't mean, of course, that the institutional services such as nursing home care won't be needed. They will, of course, be needed. But what we're doing is we're preventing individuals from, from needing services immediately and allowing them to stay in their homes and their community with their families for longer periods of time. And then at some point, they may then need uh, nursing home services. As I said earlier, it will put the entire plan of care under one plan so that individuals won't have to have to deal with multiple systems, multiple cards. And in addition, there's a lot of um, there, there's accountability with the state with the managed care organizations. And lastly, uh, it really allows the state and the citizens of Nebraska to have budget predictability, to be able to know under, under the current system, long-term care system in Nebraska and in many other states, the state does not know how, quick, how much money they're going to spend on a month-to-month -month basis, let alone on a, on a specific, um, on, an, on, on, an, on a fiscal year basis uh, annually. So this really allows the state to know because people are paid, because as we said, they're paid, the managed care organizations are paid um, on, on a month-to-month -month basis based upon a, a specific amount, then they, it's predictable and the state can actually plan for that into the future. Thank you. Uh, sorry for my delay. I'm reading through the questions. Um, the first, the ones, there's several that I just want to follow up on. Um, the first is that um, somebody asked if they, um, sorry, flipping through my phone to get the questions. Um, Um, they wanted to know if the funding allocation is going to change, and that's not included in our report. As we said, that the um, assessments um, would be um, done using a new tool, and the assessments would then determine the level of services that everybody would need. Um, but at this point, we don't we don't recommend any allocation change at all for the funding um, allocation. Secondly, I did want to say that we have um, two. Um, additional webinars just for the services coordinators um, so they can learn more about this, ask their plans, et cetera. I was correct that one is on April 10th. Go figure that one out, but I actually knew what I was talking about. Um, that's for the um, services coordinators for the, um, for the intellectual and developmental disability service providers. And then on April 11th, we have another one for the aging and disability service providers. Um, another person wrote in about the extended family homes and their concern about individuals not being able to um, continue to provide that service and asked if we could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about that. I would be happy to do that. Um, and if, I think that, Allie, you have the contact information. I can follow up with you at another point. Um, and then... Uh, there's one more that Ellie keeps asking me why I didn't say it, and I'm trying to figure out which one I didn't say. Um, the enrollment into the process, I think, in terms of the providers, we're trying to simplify and keep the enrollment process as easy as possible. Um, so I'm hoping that that's the one that she thinks I didn't say. Um, we um, are trying to keep our eye on the ball. I, and there's, the question is about Maximus, and they said that there was some difficulty around that. Um, we heard that a lot in Jan or in, sorry, in September. Um, we've also heard that it's getting better. Um, and we, um, if that's not true, please let us know. 
um, and we will continue to monitor it and um, encourage the state to also monitor it. Um, what we said in terms of the responsibilities for the state in terms of going forward with the um, Medicaid long-term services and support, um, we said that they would need to go slowly um, in order to ensure success of the rollout. Um, we encourage them to measure the quality of life um, for consumers now um, so that <clears throat> they can measure to see if you're improving. If you don't measure where you are, you don't know where you can, um, where you need to improve and if you are improving. So that's really key and critical, we think. Um, we also said that the state needs to not just do the stakeholder engagement now, but continue it all throughout this whole process of um, the redesign um, and then the rollout of managed care um, for long-term services and support. The state also has to shift its responsibility. You know, we talked earlier about the um, reallocation of what the state is doing um, and realignment of the Department of Health and Human Services. We really believe strongly that um, they have to be holding the managed care organizations accountable for um, the, the contracts and what they put into the contracts. They can also learn from all the other states that have been out there doing this for years and there are best practices um, of how to do this well. They can literally cut and paste some of the contract language so that they can hold um, the plans accountable. We also acknowledge the fact that there's gonna be a cost up front um, in order to do this, in order to um, build a no wrong door system to work to get the new assessment tools. All of those things have an upfront cost and we want to just recognize the state, you know, we understand that there's, the state had proposed um, some cuts to the providers and um, we don't want it to come at the, to the provider's um, loss and we, um, but we do want to also acknowledge the fact that this isn't designed as a savings mechanism in the front end, it's designed for budget predictability. And there are going to be some costs that need to be put in place. I will share with you that in the states that have built the robust kind of no wrong door systems that we're talking about, they've been able to see a return on their investment really rapidly within a year or two because there's so many clients that don't want to spend down into the Medicaid program if they can avoid it, are willing to pay for um, services and supports personally um, for their moms and dads and brothers and sisters um, that just don't know where to turn. So if they have a place that's easy to turn to, um, it actually can really help to forestall some of the um, um, spend downs into the Medicaid program. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're in a kind of a unique period in our nation where we're having to monitor, and in, a, in this state, where we're having to monitor what's happening federally with changes in the Affordable Care Act at the same time that we're um, doing this long-term services and support. We anticipate that there will be changes, um, potentially, that will affect um, what our proposal is, and we'll just keep our eye on the ball. And the state also will have to keep um, their eye on it. There could be changes, for example, in the managed care regulations that they would need to monitor. Before you, um, before you go there, um, the next slide, um, there are a couple of questions. Um, one of the questions is for the other 22 states, did they see overall cost increases to support these programs? Nebraska has a very small budget due to the number of citizens. What percent of citizens in those 22 states saw less support services and who saw more services? So um, certainly I can, um, many of those states did, as Martha said, saw an initial upfront cost to doing, um, to doing um, and implementing managed long-term services. But after that initial upfront cost, there wasn't an increase per se. There was basically, we, the, um, there, there was a budget predictability based upon the numbers of individuals that were being served and, and looking at, at actuarial tables and the like to see the cost, what costs it would be. Um, in addition, 
I don't believe that the majority of people that I know, both and my experience in New Jersey and also speaking to colleagues in other states like Tennessee and Texas, um, there weren't really people who lost services. Really what happens when you look at, at waiver services and you can move to manage long-term services, people who, who were receiving some services because of one waiver but couldn't receive other services because of other waivers, all of a sudden start to see more services. So, for example, in New Jersey, we saw that um, the, a doubling of the numbers of individuals who received traumatic, who received uh, services who had traumatic brain injuries. Um, they did not get the residential services, but they received other services as well through the long-term services. Another question was what kind of models, what other, what are states are some of the best models? Certainly there are best practices across many states. Um, certainly I'm a little um, personally biased towards New Jersey, but New Jersey, Texas, Tennessee are some of the states. Florida is doing some good work. Pennsylvania is actually moving right now into managed long-term care, looking at, at some of those other states. Um, there are a number of different um, um, entities that have been analyzing how states have been doing, um, and, and so, know that, so a lot of people know those best practices. So those are just a couple of the states that are doing some um, our, our models. There are many models throughout 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 the states um, that are doing some really good work. Also, I just wanted to focus in on a couple of the um, uh, what Martha was saying about stakeholder engagement. Really, the best models are stakeholder um, is best practice is stakeholder engagement, both through the planning, development, as well as implementation, and afterwards. States that have done this, um, have, you've seen, you haven't seen um, specifically um, things, the headlines saying that there are problems because, because the states worked very closely with their providers and with their consumers to make sure that that was going forward. Um, some of the states that I mentioned earlier are, are some of those states that have done that. Thanks, Paul. Um, there's a number of questions that are coming in through the queue that um, we really want to address, um, but some of them are they're problems more than um, questions. They're individual problems that you're having with some of the state systems. Um, if you can email me, um, I want to get to the bottom of them. There's some that I mean the um, participant that's got the out-of-pocket cost as high as your um, saying, um, please email me so we can get to the bottom of that. Um, similarly, the, uh, the person that's trying to enroll as a transportation broker, if you can email me, um, I, that's one of our jobs is to help to facilitate um, some of the um, corrections, if we can, course corrections, um, if at all possible. Um, um, because we have also made the presentation consumer friendly, some of the things that are um, um, included in the longer report are not included in the smaller report, including a full um, discussion about the personal attendance services and all of the issues that we heard in September, and there's a lot of recommendations for how to address that. So um, I hope that um, you can turn to the longer, the longer document to, in order to um, look at that. It's, um, the address to visit and to visit. <laughs> the address to get a copy, a complete copy of the longer document is on the screen. Um, and if, um, if you also um, click on that, you can get updates. Um, for the um, 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 for the long-term care plan, anytime we have a webinar or anything, it will be listed there. Um, there was one more question that I did want to just um, answer, and that was, um, there was a question about the assessment tool that we talked about and whether or not it would take into account um, um, the, the unique needs that some individuals or seniors um, potentially could have. And as I shared, yes, the whole point of having a, um, the single assessment tool is the hub um, has um, the same questions for all populations. Those are the questions about, you know, basic, basic things. And then each of the specialty populations, including the seniors, would have their own um, additional set of questions. And if you're, I potentially think you might be talking about somebody that is suffering from 
um, dementia, for example, there's, there's questions that would be addressing that. Um, it, isn't the, it isn't the case um, with the people that have had the assessments. In most instances, um, most instances there's um, a much more fair system put in place. There are going to be instances very um, much so that people will receive more um, services or, as Lowell said, a more robust package that can help to support their ability to stay in the community. Um, so I encourage you to read the whole plan um, and learn more about it. Um, these are all the ways that we, it is not, um, Scott, you're great. You're asking a whole bunch of really good questions. We did not recommend um, a single assessment tool um, for the state. Um, there are many that are um, used in um, the states, um, and we've, we've put a list in the longer report of some of those tools. Um, um, the inner REI is the one that I think is the most popular. Um, it's used um, in many, many states here in the United States and also internationally. Um, that's just one tool, though, and we did not, we weren't asked to pick one for the state. We just made a recommendation that they have one and stick with it. Um, so, but your questions are terrific. So, thank you for doing that. Um, the ways that you can comment are you can um, send something via the website through email. I highlighted in blue um, my um, Nebraska email, all of the comments that you send to that. Um, I'm, I am personally answering. It's taking me a little bit longer than I would love because there's a lot more in there. Um, but I will get through them all. There's a voicemail message box that we set up that um, it's just a message machine, um, but feel free to leave a message that way. You can mail things to us um, to Donna's attention and we'll receive them. And then, um, then we have the Twitter and Facebook so you can follow us as we're going throughout the state. Um, I see that Scott's asked some more questions. Um, I'm trying to... Um, um, I can answer that question. Uh, Scott's asking if we recommended specific provider rates um, or is that on a state-to-state -state basis. We do not provide that. Um, that really is on a state-to-state -state basis. Um, certainly some states have decided to, to move forward on, <clears throat> on setting some minimum rates initially, uh, the state, what would be the state-based rate with, with, uh, with the managed care organizations, um, and others have not. Um, and that's really a, something that each state has to work out with its stakeholders and with its managed care organizations. Primarily, though, this will move towards a cap to a contract with the managed care organizations as well. Um, there's a terrific series of questions as well about staffing and attracting qualified providers and staff, um, direct care workers into the system. Um, you know, Nebraska's got a really unique, um, beautiful problem to have, but also troubling problem to have in the fact that your unemployment is so low. Um, and I understand that you know, very well, um, that it's a real big challenge. That's one of the reasons that we said that you have to have the system as easy as possible for people to enroll um, and, and encourage them to really um, participate in the program to the best of their ability, whether that's through the enrollment broker, um, the services coordinator, through the, um, if they're getting paid on time, all of those things can help to attract some people in. I believe that you're probably talking, though, about individuals that are working directly for um, maybe assisted living or a nursing facility, and it is just a really tough situation. I know that we need to have those, you know, highly qualified um, individuals in those places or you don't meet the quality standards that the state is setting and that the managed care companies will set. Um, I will continue to keep my eye out for some promising practices that some other states have employed um, in, in, their, in order to encourage workers. Um, and if we can find some, some ideas, um, I'm not going to say solutions, but some ideas of ways that the state could help you even more, um, we're happy to include that in the final. Um, I think with that, we're going to have to draw the evening to a close. Um, I hope that all of you found this useful, and we look forward to hearing from more of you um, through 
both direct emails to us as well as um, any comments that you want to talk about the whole redesign plan. And um, I appreciate your spending the last hour with us, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Good night.